Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ilona Mostipan. I'm an MPhil student in economics. And uh, right now, I'm going to take you from the world of dinosaurs to our modern structures, our modern economies, and governments. So I would like to talk to you about public debt, specifically debt management strategies in advanced economies. Now, if you're a government, of course, you would first need to decide how much new debt to issue. That is primarily driven by your uh, fiscal budget. So we're going to set that question aside. Once you know your given debt level, then you essentially make three choices. What currency to issue it in? Your local currency or foreign currency? Whether to index your debt to anything, such as inflation, as well as the maturity structure meaning what composition of your new borrowing should be short-term versus long-term. Three months borrowing, one year borrowing, five years, 20 years. So maturity is the term until you have to repay it. I focus on the maturity structure because I think it's particularly interesting both from a theoretical point of view and practical point of view. Now, in modern, I guess, uh, workhorse new Keynesian models that are used recently, um, debt management and maturity does not matter at all. The intuition behind that is the following. If uh, agents have perfect foresight and markets are complete, well-functioning, then whether you buy a 10-year bond or whether you buy 10 one-year bond, so one this year, one next year, and so forth and so forth, it will not matter because you get the same return. And that's why in these theoretical recent models that hasn't been incorporated. Well, in practice, you might think, gee, real world is a bit, sounds a bit different, right? What we have seen is that after the crisis, the interest rates have hit the zero lower bound. So monetary authority can no longer lower the short-term interest rates past zero, nominal interest rates. Also, when you have high debt level already, then you know, your budget and how much new debt uh, you add is constrained. So your fiscal policy, your government expenditure is also limited and deficit financing is limited. What we have seen is that the central banks have used maturity as a policy tool. So they've been, as part of quantitative easing, the later stages, they've been rebalancing the composition of short term versus long term or long term versus short term. And that's why I think, given that this is completely at odds with the theoretical models that had been established before the crisis, it's particularly interesting. So the question I want to address is how do debt managers decide about the maturity structure of new public debt? It's just straightforward first pass question. And I look at contrasting theories, cost minimization, economic stabilization and neutrality. So I'm going to walk you through how if these are the three objectives that sound desirable, all three cannot be achieved at the same time. So a government has to choose from some of them or a combination. Cost minimization. What is that? Well, whatever thing you borrow, you want it to be as cheap as possible. So in a current setting where you have low interest rates, but they're maybe expected to increase in five to 10 year time, what you'd want to do is intuitively lock in the current low interest rates. So you would issue, you would lengthen your maturity structure so that otherwise if you issue short term, then you're going to have to refinance again and again at higher rates and you don't want to do that. Quite intuitive. Now economic stabilization and neutrality are two sides of the same coin. And these are the ideas that have been, I guess, developed after World War II in the 60s and forgotten since then. Now, here, the notion is that instead of just reacting to interest rates, maturity structure can influence real activity. So it can influence interest rates, investment, and output. Well, why and how? So let's look at that. And this is where we can look at the yield curve where on the vertical axis you have the yield or the cost of borrowing and uh, your, in, say, interest rate. And horizontal axis you have the maturity, so going from three months to maybe 30 years. And in this world you have imperfect substitutability across the yield curve. So one long-term instrument is not equal the sum of future short-term instruments because maybe you have investor habitats. What do I mean by that? A pension fund that's saving up your retirement might be a lot more interested in long-term maturity and being somewhere in this habitat. And they might not be interested in you know, three months T-bills. So in this world, imperfect substitutable. 
right? Long term and short term. So what happens? Well, let's consider the standard economics chart and uh, what you have on the vertical axis, you have the relative price, which is also the inverse of relative yield, and yield is up here. Then on the horizontal axis, you have relative quantity, which is standard, is relative, is a supply curve, is upward sloping, and demand curve is downward sloping. So when a government is rebalancing the maturity structure, say the increase short term relative to long term supply, you get an outward shift, a fall in relative prices, and an increase in relative yields. So relative increase in short term relative to long term. That is a flattening of the yield curve. And this is the main mechanism. In conclusion, here, shortening of maturity flattens the yield curve, lowers long-term interest rates, and this stimulates investment, which stimulates the economy. All right? So especially if we think that short-term interest rates are already at zero, but long-term ones are high, then the firms are deterred from making investment, from borrowing new money. Now, by lowering the long-term interest rates, by flattening the yield curve, then firms are uh, stimulated to invest more. Money is cheaper, stimulates economic activity. So specifically in a current environment, when you have low growth, low investment, and these hab habitats, you shorten the maturity to stimulate the economy. Now, the other side of the same coin, neutrality, works through the same mechanism, but perhaps the obje objective here is different. So maybe instead of wanting to change the interest rates, maybe the authority that manages debt wants to not influence the real economy at all. That could be the case if Treasury is managing debt, and then the central bank is in charge of economic stabilization, stabilizing prices, stabilizing output, as well as you know, low volatility of unemployment. And in that case, they want to not interfere with the real economic activity. So in a setting where investor preferences shift to long-term debt, you know, if the size of pension funds is growing, then there's more demand for long-term debt, because they're in this long-term habitat, then the government would lengthen the maturity, adjust to investor preferences so that the yield curve is unaffected. So altogether, we see that with cost min if you follow cost minimization in a post-crisis environment, you would want to lengthen the maturity and lock in the low interest rate. If you follow economic stabilization, you would want to stimulate the economy by shortening the maturity and flattening the yield curve. And then if you follow the neutrality strategy and you let the central bank do all the adjustment, if the investors want longer maturity, you will lengthen the maturity and accommodate the market. So can you lengthen, shorten, and lengthen at the same time? No, that's why three are impossible together. But what is interesting from this is that this can be tested empirically. So as a first pass question, this is great because this also hasn't been done before in a thorough empirical study. So my research question again is what debt management strategies do advanced economies follow? And here OECD is just a set of countries where I take my data from. So it's an uh, organization of economic cooperation and development. And I have two methodologies, panel analysis and time series analysis. Because are, they're complementary and for, with panel analysis you can look at overarching big picture and with time series analysis you can look at other features of the data specific for one country. So I would love to walk you through my preliminary findings. And uh, from panel analysis, what I get is that broadly you can say that all countries are following cost minimization strategy in the last 30 years, especially prior to the crisis. Budgetary convenience was the norm, and this was consistent uh, with the idea that maturity structure should not even be used to influence real economy. However, if you look at individual countries, I, have, I do detect some episodes of adjusting to market preferences. And this pension funds example is what I was leading you into. So this is something you've, been, you've seen in, in UK, in Canada, and other countries. And uh, this notion of economic stabilization has been only implemented very recently after the crisis. So it wasn't present from 1980s. Now my data doesn't, this specific data doesn't go back as far as World War II, but there are some qualitative studies that say after World War II, the countries have also been using this strategy. Now, why is it significant? Well, in the first place, I think this um, challenges the irrelevance of debt management in standard new Keynesian models. Um, so 
given that the policymakers have used maturity structure as a tool, some uh, theoretical work has been done. Yeah, some theoretical work has been done uh, to explain and model quantitative easing. Now, quantitative easing was complex, had several different mechanisms, so I think this is the forefront of the agenda. Now, this research also informs actual specification of the models. We see that cost minimization is something countries do, so it should be included, as well as economic stabilization neutrality choice. And more specifically, you can separate the objectives. So the debt manager can be the one who's cost minimizing, and the central banker ha can be the one who has the short-term interest rate as a conventional monetary policy tool, as well as the maturity structure as a non-conventional policy. I think the next question, and we're welcome to discuss this further, uh, later is this coordination between cost minimizing debt manager and central banker who's stabilizing. In fact, you've seen this maybe in the US, the treasury was lengthening the maturity and then the central bank was shortening the maturity. Now the caveat, well, before the caveat, do you think these two effects offset each other, right? So maybe neither one nor the other is accomplished. Well, the caveat is that the cost minimization, the treasury operates in the primary market. So the first time borrowing new debt, whereas the central bank operates in the secondary market where that previously issued debt is actively traded. So maybe they don't offset each other. It depends on how the two are connected, what is the pass through between primary and secondary, and that hasn't been modeled theoretically at all to my knowledge. Of course, the implication for central bank independence um, is if coordination is optimal, does that compromise the independence of central bank, which is something that has been established in the last you know, 20 years that central bank should be acting aside from political economy pressures on its mandate of uh, stabilizing prices and stabilizing the economy. So I hope I have shown you that even such a basic question of, you know, what uh, a positivist question, right? What debt management strategies have countries been following is very helpful for modern research and modern theoretical models to improve our understanding of the options after the crisis. Thank you. Thank you.